Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Coalition of Firewise Communities. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, it's getting a little warmer and I'm, I'm happy that it's light outside. You know how I hate the dark when, we, when we're meeting in the winter time. But, and I don't see that Chief Mathias is on the, on the uh, call yet, but, oh, he is there. Well, in honor of Chief Mathias, I just want, wanted, I have a question for everybody. I don't think we have to poll it, but did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? It's got great food, but no atmosphere. In, in keeping with the food uh, theme, uh, what do you call a fish with two knees? A toonie fish. Oh, Bob. <laughs> I just, Everybody else is muted, well, so you're not getting any reaction. That's why. <laughs> no reaction. Well, I mean, Chief Matthias one-upped me at the, at the stakeholder meeting. I wasn't ready for that. So anyway, again, welcome to everybody. And uh, just a reminder, we are recording the uh, recording the uh, the meeting. So uh, just make sure nobody photo bombs in the background. So uh, did I hear you, Chief Matthias? Are you there? I thought I heard him. Where's my participant list? Wrong cursor. Let's make sure he's not muted. Yeah. I don't know, where is he? I thought I heard him. Huh. I, I don't see him. But there's, um, a, uh, there's a phone that's muted at, at 1706. Let's see, Caleb, can you um, unmute the phones? There, maybe that's him there. Bob, try again. Uh, Chief, Chief Matthias, are you there? Maybe not. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to your next speaker. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to. Uh, so the next person on the list I see is um, uh, Lieutenant Bob. Uh, Bob. Bob Jacobs. Are you? Uh, are you going to speak for the Emergency Operations Center tonight? Or is uh, yeah Paul going to join us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Great. Yeah. Sometimes my my audio doesn't work so well depending on what I'm using. So yeah, no, I appreciate it, uh, Lieutenant Jacobs with the Sheriff's Office assigned to OES. Uh, I'm not sure that Paul Cummings is going to make it on tonight. Uh, he's part of our Sheriff's Search and Rescue group, and they had a search and rescue call out earlier today that he went to. So. I don't believe he's going to be here to provide an update, but I can certainly provide you with information that I have. So we just want to remind everybody, let everybody know that the Ready, Set, Go handbooks all went out in the mail. So please look for those and uh, make sure you let all your neighbors know that they've, they've come out. Uh, please take an opportunity to sit down and go through that. There's some, there's some really great information in there, uh, resources and all the things that you're going to need going into this next wildfire season. Um, OES has our evacuation annex, our mass evacuation annex, which is our county emergency operation plan that describes how the county is going to handle a mass evacuation. Uh, that is up for public comment right now on our OES website. So if you haven't had an opportunity to go on and read that and submit any comments that you want, you do so. The comment period, the public comment period is going to be through June 30th. Also online with that is our heat plan. The county also has a heat plan that talks about how we're gonna deal with high heat days and opening up cooling centers and whatnot. So again, if you haven't had a chance to, to look through that, uh, please log on to our website and take the opportunity to read it and provide any feedback that you might have. And then once the public comment period is over, we'll be taking both of those plans to our county board of supervisors. Uh, Jen Tamo wanted me to remind everybody, please take advantage of the free green waste days that we have going. We've been advertising them a lot. Uh, but in addition to the, the green waste drop off, uh, there's actually uh, mulch. We have a lot of mulch, so it's available. If there's anybody out there that needs it, there's plenty of it out there on the Brunswick site. Uh, if I can share my screen, I believe I have a flyer up that I can show you. 
Just a second here. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's our advertisement for the free mulch pickup. It's happening Fridays and Saturdays, uh, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And this is going to be through June 27th. Uh, we've got a couple locations here. We've got the 10513. We've also got the Brunswick Road location, which is 12625 Brunswick Road. That's that that's the old Bohemia Lumber Mill site out there. Plenty of mulch, so if you need it, uh, it's great to use around your property if you're looking for weed control. I ask that you don't put any of that down within 30 feet of the house. Uh, try to keep that away from your residence. There's plenty of mulch. Uh, I can see that. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Right, there we go. Uh, OES had a, a meeting with pg and &E earlier today. Uh, I was not on that meeting, but I did speak with Jen Tamo, who gave me some highlights from that meeting that I'd like to go through just briefly. Uh, and all this information is going to be available on PGE's website. So she encourages anybody to that has any further questions to go on there. Uh, PGE is going to be putting up a lot of a lot of resources. Uh, during that meeting, they talked about how they've installed 16 switches throughout our county to help really kind of dial in and narrow down the areas uh, where they're going to have. PSPS. Uh, they're aiming to make these PSPSs shorter in duration uh, with faster restoration times. Uh, we're, we're very hopeful that we're going to be able to keep the city of Grass Valley uh, on generation if we do encounter a PSPS, uh, much like we did last year. Uh, they had uh, several different CRCs or community resource centers that were open last year. Uh, they were kind of a tent style that they set up out in the parking lots. Uh, this year, they're really aiming to make those brick and mortar locations. Uh, we've already been in contact with our county to secure a number of different sites throughout the county. Obviously, with COVID-19 concerns, with congregate settings, uh, it's yet to be seen what those will actually look like. Uh, but they are looking to do brick and mortar locations. Uh, those, those CRCs were set up for people that could you know, just get out of the heat uh, somewhere during the day to go plug in your electronics if you needed to. Uh, some of them also had uh, stations set up for charging metal, medical equipment. So if you get a chance, go on to pg &E's website, and I think I can share my screen again and show you some of the stuff that pg and has got up. If I can find it here real quick. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, yep. this is the theme that pg and &E is trying to push out right now. Uh, smaller in size, shorter in duration, and smarter for customers. So again, if you get a chance, log on to pg and &E's website. They got a lot of information floating out there for you. Uh, town halls. So OES was involved in a UVanet town hall uh, last week. It was focused on Western Nevada County. Uh, we have another town hall coming up another UVanet Town Hall. It's going to be next week on Thursday, June 11th, and that's going to be starting at noon. And that's going to be concentrating on Eastern Nevada County. So if any of you have an opportunity and you, you want to see what's going on with Eastern Nevada County, please log on to that. Bob, you need to stop sharing your screen. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Yep, there we go. Uh, lastly, our DSI program. Uh, we've had our DSI program back up and running now for about a month. Uh, so you may see our DSI inspectors out there uh, roaming around uh, doing their inspections. Uh, we were hoping to collaborate with CAL FIRE on that. Uh, I, I know you mentioned Jim Mathias was, oh, no, I see Jim on here now. I'm sure Jim will probably talk about their DSI program. But we're certainly looking to work with uh, the CAL FIRE DSIs as well as uh, the DSIs up out of the truck area. That's what I have for OES. So I have I have a question for you, my, uh, uh, Bob. My understanding is at the uh, waste drop-off sites and with the uh, with the mulch, uh, you have loaders there. If you have a pickup truck, uh, 
this isn't a uh, shovel it in your pickup bed all by yourself event. Is that am I correct or? So Jen Tamo is kind of our in-house expert on the Greenway stuff. I haven't visited the site personally, but I've driven by it several times. And I can tell you they do have equipment there. They have some skid steer, uh, little tractors there. Uh, there may be somebody on right now visited that site that might be able to really tell you better. But Julie, Julie knows. She's smiling. Yep, I got all the answers for you. There we go. Would you like me to jump in now, or you guys have a no, well, on that, you to... on that question, if you would, so that everybody knows. Yeah. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. We do have loads on site. We have a loader on site in Penn Valley, and we also have one over at the Brunswick site. So somebody can just put in on Friday or Saturday, anytime between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., and we will gladly dump a pile of mulch into the back of whatever vehicle they choose. Um, for some of the people who have smaller vehicles, they prefer to hand load and they're welcome to do so. We help them with that uh, whenever possible. We've got some shovels and pitchforks and things like that on site, although it is by far the least efficient way, unless your goal is burning calories. And um, we are right now looking at some options. Um, we found some larger consumers of the mulch. We found that there are some people who come back repeatedly and rather than force them to keep loading trucks and then going to their homes and unloading, we're looking at making deliveries uh, for free for them, provided they are in a reasonable um, distance from the, uh, the um, distribution sites and provided we can get our equipment in and out of there safely and um, provided they will take 10 cubic yards at a time. Wow, that's, that's great news. That's a great service that you're offering. So I'm sure some people will be interested in taking advantage of that. Okay, thanks, Julie. And- uh, Hey, Bob. Hey, thank Bob. Do you want me to yes. mute everybody again and then you can ask yeah. the next speaker to unmute because we do have a lot of folks who are um, unmuted, but I yes, can do please. that if you'd like. Okay, so mute all. Means I have to unmute me. You okay, do. so. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Bob. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the update. And I, I forgot, when I was welcoming everybody, I forgot to go through the normal announcements. We really don't have any uh, of significance. And uh, Bob already hit the one I was gonna talk about and that's the green waste, so. Uh, Excuse me, we'll, Bob, may, uh, may I ask a question of Bob Jacobs? Oh, sure. There was the, I'm uh, trying to get some notes here so I can put some things in the hits and misses for the paper. And I wanna mention the comments Public comments invited on the county emergency evacuation plan until June 30th. And then I think you said that there was another, that there's something else also that you're taking public comments on and I didn't get that one. Yeah, no problem. That's our county's HEAT plan, H-E-A-T, HEAT plan. What does the H-E-A-T plan, uh, H-E-A-T stand for? HEAT, like summer heat. Hot oh. It's just heat. That's not. An, it's not an acronym. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and also uh, until June thirtieth, and I'll probably be able to find web links to those on the uh, MikeNevadaCounty.com website. Yeah, if you go to the OES page. Okay. And on the left hand side, you'll see it says emergency plans. Click okay. on that, and then just scroll down. You'll see both of the, both of those annexes. Now. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yep. Back Thank to you. you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Chief Mathias, uh, you're up next, if you'll unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I will unmute myself. I was having some problems earlier today. Is my computer working okay for you? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, that's terrific. Uh, wow, okay, so thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, I see a lot of uh, faces that I've seen in a lot of other meetings, so it might be repetitive, but I see probably about 30 other people that haven't heard my spiel, so I'll give it to you. I've been communicating with uh, Bob Long quite a bit. Matter of fact, the other day he told me, <laughs> don't smile. He told me that he was gonna quit his job as a can crusher. 
And I said, well, Bob, why are you going to do that? And he said, oh, it's so depressing. So <laughs> the so depressing. So de don't, oh, yeah, okay. Your firefighting abilities are better than your jokes. <laughs> Well, and, and everybody's muted except for just a couple of us, Jim, so you're not getting much feedback there. That's terrific. That, that joke calls for some canned laughter. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll start off with, with our fuels and the fire weather and what we're looking at this year, folks, because, uh, you know, we really don't know where we're at until we're in it. Uh, I know that we're very similar to 2018 fuel conditions, and that turned out to be the campfire. Uh, so this is not a good place that we're in, and we didn't have any rainfall at all in February. Uh, we had very little in January, but lately it seems like we've had a lot. And so everybody would think, gosh, we're pretty relieved that we've had that rain, and we'll certainly take anything that we can get. But keep in mind, rain of two inches followed by temperatures of 100 degrees doesn't really give us that ground saturation, which means that the fuels don't get to green up uh, and, and it, the trees don't green up, the brush doesn't green up, and our fuels up in the north, uh, the higher elevations are still very dry. Uh, we had a three acre fire uh, from escape control burn down in the South County today. We had a 250 acre fire in Lincoln yesterday. Yuba County's ready to burn our lower elevations, South County, Penn Valley area. All of that grass is cured and it's all ready to go. And it's all because we haven't had a substantial rainfall in the normal green up time and it's starting to get very hot. Even though we've had a few episodes of rain, it, it rain in May does not equate to, to rain in January or February because it just doesn't get into the trees and the brush the way that it does. So let's talk about the forecasters. Once again, weather is you know, one of those jobs you can always be wrong and still have a job, but uh, they're the, the, the Enzo, El Nino Southern Oscillation is in question. Are we gonna have an El Nino year or an El Nino year? Nobody really knows until it happens, but they pay attention to surface temperatures of the Pacific Ocean. So the surface temperatures were a little bit cooler kind of between California and Hawaii off to the south a little bit. So what they were thinking is that was gonna to lead to an El, uh, El Nino, not El Nino, so a drier trend this summer. That, that temperature, surface temperature, moved from where it was at to kind of all the way around Baja, California, down towards Mexico. So what that can do, both those things, is it can draw our normal jet stream further to the south uh, and push up some of our, our normal high pressure systems over the top of us. So that's all great stuff, Jim. What does that mean to me? That means that the normal monsoonal flows that we're gonna get through California later in the year would normally bring a little bit of lightning, which isn't terrible if it's associated with water, but because it's not monsoonal flow, uh, it's more associated with dry lightning. So the prediction is, more dry lightning, more of those high pressure systems that are gonna uh, place themselves perfectly to shoot us the north winds or the northeast winds, which are the dangerous winds, similar campfire situations, 49er fire situations, the Lobo fire, all those fires that we've had locally that were wind driven. It looks like uh, we're, we're kind of lining up possibly for that again, who, knew, who really knows for sure. Um, so over the last week in Nevada County, we've had 11 vegetation fires. So we'll see how that pans out. But the 11 vegetation fires, we've caught them all uh, and right up until yesterday's fire of uh, a little over 250 acres in Placer County, uh, we've been having pretty good success with catching most of our fires. Uh, this time last year, we're up 79 acres until yesterday, uh, and then you add another 250 onto that, and we're up 87 wildland fires from where we were this time last year. So, some pretty good more potential there. As far as what Cal Fire is doing for our state preparedness, uh, we are going to our peak staffing on the 8th or the 15th. We don't really know for sure, and certainly could be pushed back later 
with uh, budget issues and the needs and, and the weather and all that kind of stuff, or it could be moved up sooner. But right now we have an engine in each station and pretty soon we'll have two engines in uh, all of our stations, but three, which is our normal staffing. Uh, we do have our fuels crew in Grass Valley up and running. They're performing well, reducing fuels everywhere they go. So that's good to have a crew that just does fuels reduction. They're not a fire related crew. We have four crews at Washington Ridge that are trained and recertified, they're ready to go. Up until yesterday, we had two additional National Guard crews that were helping us out. And they, one of those two crews had typed out to a type one crew. So that was pretty successful. Yesterday they got uh, deployed to another uh, emergency that's working in California. And so they do, uh, they do protection of infrastructure in California. So they were, they're doing their other jobs, the National Guard doing that part of it. As soon as this is all over with, they'll come back to us and they'll be reassigned as fire crews. We're on track with our Blackhawks. As a matter of fact, we flew one of our brand new Blackhawks on the fire yesterday. Very successful, very neat rig. It, uh, it flies very fast, carries a lot of water, and is a very successful addition to our air operation fleet. Uh, we have two tankers up at Grass Valley, at least one right now. The other one is just finishing off its maintenance. I believe it's gonna be back up here later. Uh, and so we're looking pretty good there. And our air attack, as we speak right now, should be landing, uh, I would guess, right now at, a, at wheels touching down in Grass Valley. So then we'll have our, our, our platform that kind of goes and controls the air traffic controller over the top of us. They'll be there and they'll be staffed uh, for the summer on June 15th. So it's good just to have that platform back and through maintenance and it's back on base and uh, landed at Grass Valley. Ponderosa Way is looking good. Uh, our fuels reduction around there uh, is going terrific. We've, uh, a couple of the, the entities in Nevada County have been very successful with other grants to reduce fuels. Uh, one of the board objectives was to reduce fuels around the roadways. So the County of Nevada wrote a grant and they were awarded that with their public works for uh, reduction of fuels around roadways, $868,000 $868,084. Another 1.5 million went to fuels reduction in the Truckee area, so that's pretty good. And uh, we'll move our hand crews around to support those operations, including the National Guard crew when they get back. I talked with Trish. She said that she said she'll take as many crews as we can get them. So we're finishing off how to actually get that money to the county because as you can, you can bet, the state of California is very, it's very difficult to process money. So they're working on it. Uh, they've been awarded those grants and pretty soon they'll be getting that money and we'll be able to put those crews to work. Uh, lots of good stuff happening uh, on the, the west side here as far as our equipment. Uh, east side was busy with a bunch of fires last year and, and pile burning and reductions. And we had a, a fire engine over there all winter that, that responded to just tons of of uh, incidents in the Truckee and I-80 corridor for the, the eastern part of Nevada County. On the western part of Nevada County, we have uh, our two new dozers. The first one I told you about in Nevada City we got last year, and then over the winter we got another new dozer, and that'll be staffed up at Dobbins. We've always had a, a, a dozer at those two stations, but we just have newer, better equipment uh, from a 1960s dozer to uh, 20, 18 dozer uh, and going up from a D4 to a D6 is quite an upgrade. So new dozers, new tractors to pull those and new trailers for them to rest on. We're pretty excited about that. Washington Ridge Camp went through their recertification. All four crews are up and running and recertified. We're still low on inmate population. We can have five crews there. We have the personnel, the staff, but we just don't have the inmates. So as soon as we get enough inmates, we'll be taking care of that. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much what's going on with us. We're staffed and ready for summer the best that we can be. And uh, thanks for your time. Oh, I didn't talk about DSIs like Bob told me I was going to. Our, our DSIs, we have six of them hired. They're out there. They're doing inspections. Of course, we have to social distance. Uh, and that's really tough. But our job for those folks is to educate the public as much as possible. And they... They have been trying to do that. They've been out for about three weeks and they'll continue to be out there and they'll, they'll do the best social distancing 
and the best practices that they can, but we certainly want to educate folks on uh, fuels reduction. And before I cut off, I just see Mr. Peach sitting there with just such a smile on his face. We did that when we drill over the weekend at his place, had several engines from Cal Fire, and we had uh, a Nevada County Consolidated and a Nevada City slash Grass Valley engine. It was a Nevada City engine with Grass Valley staffing. Uh, we all went out there and trained, uh, had a great time, knocked, knocked some cobwebs off, uh, and, and did evolutions and hose lays, which is where you, you kind of put a hose out and charge with water and you go through the forest where you can't drive with a fire engine. We did hand line construction discussions. We didn't actually put a shovel in the ground because we didn't complete a CEQA and we all know how that is. So we practiced on that. We did an incident within an incident where we uh, uh, simulated a firefighter injured that had to be brought, brought up on a rope system. Uh, we did shelter deployment. So in case some of our firefighters were burned over we talked about how to do that better, more efficiently. And then we did our bread and butter evolution on Mr. Peach's house itself, uh, which is our wildland urban interface, our stay and defend or our prep and go uh, scenario where we, we defended his house and then deployed immediately to another house. So packed up everything and left pretty quickly. So uh, Mr. Peach, sir, thank you very much for allowing us to do that at your property. It's beautiful there. He was really nice to us, supported us, and gave us, gave us a, an invaluable training opportunity. So thank you. That's it for me now. Thanks, Chief. I'm not sure if everybody's aware that the WUI drills, uh, fire drills, were canceled uh, this year. There was a large one scheduled up on uh, Banner Mountain and one on the McCourtney Road uh, Firewise community areas. And we had to cancel them because of the uh, of uh, the COVID vi uh, virus. And uh, just so you all know, one of the things that I was really happy about is Suburban Propane had offered to do the barbecues for both events. So uh, a shout out to Suburban Propane for having offered to do that. And they're on board for next year already uh, when we plan them, uh, the wooly drills for next year. So, um, okay, thanks. Any questions for uh, Chief Mathias? Bob, I have about 10 pictures I could share that you think that'd be interesting uh, from the weekend. Maybe let's see how the meeting goes. Okay. Because uh, the speaker may take a few minutes. Right. Okay, so uh, then the next thing would be uh, consolidated. So uh, Chief uh, Patrick Mason is on the line. Do you have anything to, for the good of the order? Yeah, good evening. Um, we're slowly but surely climbing our way out of this COVID thing, uh, reopening our office, uh, getting out a little bit more um, into the public. One of the big things that we have going right now is the uh, about two months ago, we mailed out a letter to all of the vacant parcel owners within our fire district. And when we did that, it kind of just opened the floodgates for a lot of individuals that live outside of the area, live out of the state. I haven't looked at their property in 15 years. Um, so I'm receiving a lot of phone calls on that. A lot of people want to know what their properties look like. So currently we're using our drone. I'll go fly over their properties, take some photos, put together a list of recommendations, kind of set up a vegetation management plan with a property owner and email everything back to them. Uh, once they receive that, they reach back out to me and usually the question is, who do I go to to get this work done? Um, I got to give a shout out to the Fire Safe Council with their list of vendors that they got on their website. Makes it very easy to be able to send somebody to that website. And they're very happy with it. Um, once they get the vendor all set up, uh, usually I'll go meet the vendor out at their property, set up the, the game plan. Once the work is done, I'll email the owner back and the payment's made. So we're able to remove quite a bit of vegetation off these vacant lands and the property owner never even asked to come out to look at their property. So pretty good program, it's working very well. That's fantastic, thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Uh, could you share what that letter said? I mean, the generic letter? We have a vacant lot next to us. We've been uh, nagging them for years to do something and haven't gotten anywhere. So. If you could send it to us, and I'd love to be able to send it out to our neighborhood to tell people what's going on here. 
Yeah, uh, I don't see who's speaking right now. Who was that? Oh, uh, th this is Vicki Reeder. Um, I'm with uh, Greater Champion. Okay. All right. Gotcha. For sure. Bob can't hear you. Yep, there you go. Yeah, there you I go. keep forgetting. So, okay, thank you very much. Appreciate all the information. And so next uh, is the Fire Safe Council. So Julie or Don, who's going to present for the Fire Safe Council? Can't hear you, Julie. Yeah, Julie, Julie. Don, you're not working. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna go ahead. I'm just gonna go ahead and jump in. And Don, if you can add at the end, if you have anything beyond green waste that you want to talk about, if that's okay with you. All right, so um, I'm gonna give you some stats on green waste. That's kind of the fun thing. Uh, we're using tablets to collect information on site and that enables us to look at the information even to the minute um, based on uh, the traffic at each site and the numbers are pretty exciting. So first of all, I'm going to start off with Truckee over in um, Eastern Nevada County. The first date that we had collection was uh, May 22nd. We had 136 loads come through from the hours of 8 a.m. until about 2 p.m. We filled eight 30 cubic yard bins that were hauled off, um, circulated throughout the day by TTSD over in Truckee and they did a great job of keeping that site moving uh, well for us, keeping it safe and fluid. And then the following week, we had an increase. We got up to 172 customers. We were a little bit more um, aggressive in how we packed down the bin. So once again, it yielded 240 cubic yards of material that was hauled off. In Alta Sierra in week one, as you know, we had that rainstorm and unfortunately the site became unsafe and we had to shut that down. There's no point in trying to protect people from a virus if they slip in the mud and get rolled over by a truck. And so we had to shut that site down after only 33 loads and um, reroute traffic to the other sites. Week two, we saw a dramatic increase. We had a total of 415 loads come through Alta Sierra. And then on week three, we had a slight decrease. We were down to about 298, um, which was you know, uh, sort of expected. And then in Grass Valley, um, that site is just going gangbusters. It's the largest site. I think it's probably the most convenient for a lot of people. Um, and so we had week one, 343 loads. Week two, 590 loads. Week three, get this number, 996 loads came through. Wow. And it, yeah, it's incredible. And in Penn Valley, Week one, 166. Week two, 464. Week three, 280. All told, Grass Valley obviously was the winning uh, site with 1,929 loads. All told in Western Nevada County, 3,419 loads. And in all of Nevada County, 3,727 loads, which is amazing considering the, the residents are the ones who are doing the unloading in a lot of cases, but we also have crews of um, kids, including one of my older sons who just graduated from high school, and he's out there um, pulling brush out of the back of, of uh, trucks to make it easy for those who are not able to do so themselves. So as far as overall trends, what I'm seeing is in Alta Sierra and Penn Valley, the numbers are trending downward slightly. Um, and then in Grass Valley and Truckee, the numbers are trending upward. Generally speaking, what we see um, over the, the length of the green waste event is you're gonna have a lot of activity at the beginning and a lot of activity at the end and not that much in the middle, which is exactly the same model on a, on a daily basis at each site. And I call it the procrastinators 
oh, sorry, the early birds and the procrastinators. That's kind of the division um, in terms of when people come and drop off. So for volunteers, we've had amazing success in that. We have 800, uh, sorry, not 800. That would be amazing. I would love that. 86 unique volunteers. Um, they, one of our struggles is last minute cancels, but I think that that's normal in any volunteer base. Something else comes up that's more important. And so we kind of wiggle around a little bit. Thankfully, our model is built on five volunteers per site. We can actually run it smoothly with three volunteers per site. It just is a little bit more work for those three volunteers. Um, we have a dedicated set of volunteers in Truckee. And those were provided to us by, um, I don't remember exactly the service, but the ladies came from the library and they come out there faithfully and stand in their positions um, each time and they've been wonderful. So um, as far as our expectations, we expect the numbers to go down slightly the next two weeks. And I expect a sharp uptick in numbers the final week. Um, as you know, we are grinding on site in Penn Valley and also at the um, at the Rise Gold site over in Grass Valley. Uh, we're working really hard to keep up with the grinding. We are unfortunately not getting as much interest in the mulch as we thought we would get. And we're hopeful that the word will spread a little bit more. Um, but we've looked at some larger consumers. So things like Sammy's Friends and um, Sierra Harvest Food Love and um, let's see, some of the wineries, I think Grape Pine Winery would like some big loads dropped off, and then the Master Gardener Society and the Farm Bureau. And so to get that material out there where it needs to be, we have um, a truck that, or a trailer rather, that's um, you know, a dump trailer for the Fire Safe Council, and we have one of our staff members available. So as I said earlier, as long as the, the the recipient of the mulch is close by and it's a safe site that we can dump at, um, you know, and the people understand that if, you know, we pop a tire on blackberries they have at their site, well, that's going to be on them. They're going to have to replace that tire for us. So as long as everybody understands exactly how it's going to work, we can get rid of the, the accumulated mulch very, very, very quickly. So if you guys want some, you're going to have to get back to me as soon as possible to make sure I get that, get you on the list and check out the, the delivery site. Um, you can send me an email. My email is programs at rufiresafe.com. So I, I want to point out that we did have a comment on the uh, chat that uh, one of one of the members went to the green waste on Brunswick today and they were in and out in 10 minutes. I mean, that's that's real service. That's really great. Um, Julie, do you want to mention anything about the chipping service? Yeah, chipping is up and running. We were off today for some reason. I think that um, I'm actually not sure why. I was so focused on green waste. I don't know why chipping was off today. But chipping service has continued, and we're working hard to get everybody caught up. And um, I think our wait time is probably, I'm going to say, three weeks at this point, but maybe a little bit faster as we start really um, you know, kicking in the, uh, the extra gas so to speak, to get that all done. That's great. And then we had a question, and I, you, you may not have an answer to it, but maybe if we discover the answer, we can communicate it by email. We had a question about a road association that is working with Cal Fire to build an emergency escape route. And they're wondering if there's any grants out there that would be available to them to help with this work. I mean, are you aware of anything that they could tap into? Yeah, unfortunately, with the opening of our Truckee office and running green waste and getting the fire season guide out, that is um, a little bit beyond my bandwidth at the moment, but that is definitely an issue question. Okay, so I'll, I'll communicate with Jamie. Thank you very much. So any, any uh, questions for the Fire Safe Council? Okay, if oh, not, I, I was just going to say the numbers are fantastic and congratulations yeah. on all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think the best part is, is you don't have to unload your own trailer and that it happens so fast. Thank you. And that it's, yeah. 
and that it's safe. I mean, us us old folks can go out there and we don't have to worry about uh, cross contamination. I mean, that's I mean that's really a great service. Yeah. Okay. It's been very well received. Thank you. Yeah. Kudos. Okay. So tonight, uh, kind of. Uh, departing from what we've done in, on our Zoom meetings in the past, we do have a speaker tonight. Uh, we have Wanda Mertens with us. Uh, she's a local insurance broker and she's on the Fire Safe Council as a board member. And we've had a question a couple of times now that is not the question that you might think she's going to answer, but it's a question about liability. There's new Fire Safe community or FireWise communities that are concerned about the liability of putting together a work crew and then having some untoward incident occur and uh, how, how is that managed? Uh, and uh, so I invited Wanda to be a speaker tonight and answer that question uh, about liability issues, signing waivers, all those wonderful things that we deal with in our workaday life, but not in our volunteer life. So, Wanda, you're up. You got to unmute yourself. I'm still there learning. <laughs> Thanks, Wanda. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think I'll just give you a basic answer for this question has been as presented. Um, understanding liability from a volunteer's perspective is that under normal circumstances, you are volunteering. So myself as a homeowner, if I'm doing something with a volunteer group and I go out, I do something, I cause harm or damage to someone, um, it's not intentional. And if a suit is brought towards me, your homeowners do step up and represent. You have to be found at fault. Uh, you have to be basically guilty of doing something incorrectly. Um, I think the question that would be better answered would be, what is someone worried about what exposure they have? Because when someone comes to us and says, we need a liability policy, um, various carriers will do various coverages. It's all a matter of what is the risk and the basic fives, who, what, when, where, and why. So often I'll have someone come in, they're part of a group, they may or may not have bylaws. Um, they give the who, what, when, where, and why, and we submit that to the underwriters because there are so many different carriers that are interested or not interested. Um, so I think that's a basic, explanation of liability and what we do. Uh, there is no limit as to who can ask for it, but if I was to give an example like of a, a road association, when you're association, you generally have bylaws, you usually have a treasurer, there's money that is collected. That all in itself is a very easy, um, uh, liability policy to obtain simply because there's cash flow, there's accountability, and there's structure. When you're just participating as a volunteer in a group, the purpose is to have permission. So if you're going to a neighbor's house and you're taking out what they said is okay, um, I've never seen any issue come of that ever. Um, there's no intent to do. Um, malice towards anybody and the i would say myself as a homeowner if you were to come there and i say please take out all the berry bushes cut everything down i have given you permission end of story so as each firewise community comes together if they are choosing to create a group the only time it becomes more specific is if you're collecting money and hiring services to do the job. When once cash comes in and there's a compensation that could be interpreted, that's when it becomes a little more um, worthy of 
who, what, when, where, and why, exactly how much money is handled, who is responsible for the money, and who is accountable. Does that help? I think the question that I've been asked before is about waivers. So you put together a group of six or seven volunteers in the neighborhood, and you're going to uh, either clear the site of, presuming you have permission from the homeowners, you're gonna do the 10 foot clearing on the side of the road or whatever. And, uh, and one of the crew is injured, they sprain an ankle, you know, cut their finger or whatever. And uh, is anybody liable when that happens? As a volunteer, there's a certain amount of um, perceived responsibility. If you are volunteering, you are coming to do an activity. Uh, if it was to be brought to an adjuster, uh, the question is, what were you doing that caused harm and damage to yourself? Basically, you cannot be insured against your own behavior. You can only have insurance for behavior that harms others. So um, obviously if you have a waiver with a Firewise community and everybody's volunteering and there's concerns, you can always say, as part of this group, I waive any liability towards anyone else. I accept responsibility for my own behavior. Uh, ultimately, if someone wanted to be um, more persuasive and decide to blame the leader, um, there's nothing that's going to stop them from filing suit. The question is, is it a valid claim? Um, uh, Wanda, can you hear me? This is Susan. Yes. We have a I question think. from Sam in the chat. He says, for instance, maybe they're cutting brush and a log rolls down the hill accidentally gets in the path of a car. Or they have a burn mm -hmm. pile that gets out of control and burns the neighbor's property. Okay, so let's take the log that rolls down the hill. Um, if they are responsible for that behavior, then they have to accept responsibility for the consequence. In, in, in the insurance world, um, you carry comp and collision on your car. So let's say you have comp and collision. Uh, the car would be fixed and repaired by the owner's policy. If there was a deductible that was applicable that should come from this activity, that would be brought back to whoever was responsible. Um, I feel that when you're working on projects of that magnitude, there would need to be more attention given to the environment. Right. And then and how about the uh, burn pile that might get out of control and burn the neighbor's property? <laughs> if I if I was on a <laughs> if I was in a volunteer neighborhood group, I wouldn't touch a burn pile project with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. I I would say that. I mean, the 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 safe zone for a burn pile is the burn has to be the property owner's burn. Period. It has to stay within their property boundaries, whatever that may be. If it goes outside of the property line, then the homeowner is responsible for that. Um, I, was, I was trying to think of circumstances that I've had. Um, we had our own burn and it was pretty good size, but it stayed on the property and, and that's where it was to stay. It was, uh, author, you know, it was a burn day, everything was fine. Never ever in 30 years seen any claims of this magnitude or nature ever even if the house catches on fire out of negligence and it burns the neighbor's house i've never seen action brought against that homeowner thank you so does uh anybody have any uh questions uh for wanda um i do this is vicky weeder um so what if we have a celebration party and somebody has one too many, and then on the way home they hit somebody, and that person sues us. Do they? Can they sue the officers, or who are they suing? Well, I'll just give you my experience with that specific type of claim. 
if alcohol is consumed for any reason, the location of the alcohol consumption and the person who's in charge of that activity is the one who is responsible. So um, if you allow someone to leave a party intoxicated, uh, you can ultimately be brought into civil action also, not just liability. Uh, it would be uh, negligent for anyone to have a function where someone leaves a party drunk. And those are questions that would possibly be handled more by an attorney as to how the courts would look at it and how um, law enforcement would handle the incident. I can only speak from experience from someone leaving a house intoxicated, having an accident, and law enforcement came back to say, where was the alcohol consumed and why did this happen? Clearly this individual should not have been allowed to drive. So then would you recommend like event insurance or if, if I'm sorry. Are, so if, if a group is going to have a barbecue uh -huh. and I'd say most of us, you know, are consume alcohol responsibly, but blah, blah, blah. Um, would we need to have like event insurance or what would you recommend? Well, I think there's two ways of looking at it. First off, if the group has the sizing and the activities, the who, what, when, where, it might be good due diligence just to see would a liability policy for that Firewise community be appropriate and cost effective? So that would be my first suggestion because dealing with the facts of the yes and the no's is much better when you have it documented. Um, event assurance, event, a single event insurance is wonderful. It's extremely inexpensive because the risk factors are so minimal and you can go online and pay $75 for it. It's really that simple. So you can go either way. Those options are certainly available. And if alcohol is a concern, then it would be worth one, the $75 at event, or to look into a group policy, which would cover some of these other issues that you're speaking of. Thank you. So when we have barbecues in our uh, Firewise community, we, we serve water and soda. But if somebody wants to bring their own six pack, you know, we, we don't say no. Right. Does that mitigate the obligation of the homeowner where we're having the uh, barbecue? As long as the homeowner is not providing the alcohol, it, the, the law enforcement aspect and the legal aspect that has come back on claims is simply where did the individual obtain the alcohol? So if you're not supplying it, they bring it themselves. You can't stop that. Right. And that's, we, we provide the water and soda. Not, nothing that's else. right. Yeah. The air to breathe. That's it. So are there any other questions of, uh, of Wanda? If not, thank you very much for taking time to be with us tonight, Wanda. I really appreciate your time and your expertise. And wait, you know, wait, oh, wait, wait. There's oh. another. There's another question that came in on the chat before you. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you, Wanda. No worries. Where is it? I'll get it, Bob. If we hire Hanson oh. Brothers to help with an evacuation route, do we provide liability insurance? Well, I would hope not. <laughs> True. No, you would not. Um, if you're going to if you're going to be creating an evacuation route, there's obviously a new, quite a bit more planning than just the Hanson brothers coming up to do it. So I'm sure there are codes that would have to be questioned, or um, I mean, you just couldn't you just. Unless it's on your own property, you don't have the right to make a road until you have all of the appropriate people to sign off on it. When you're hiring professionals, you would ask to be listed as an additional insured on their liability policy. It doesn't cost anything. 
so should they be doing work and cause harm and damage due to what they are doing, you are protected by their liability policy. So two things. Uh, uh, one uh, that we didn't mention, uh, before you do any work, for instance, if you're clearing roads, you need to make sure that you have the property owner's permission in writing to clear 10 feet of defensible space on their property that abuts the road. So nothing will protect you against not getting that written permission. And then number two, the Fire Safe Council has on their website a list of contractors. And those contractors are all vetted and they're vetted on a regular basis. Uh, they're vetted with the Better Business Bureau and they're vetted to make sure they have a current contractor's license uh, which, of course, requires that they have the necessary insurance. So you have the resources to be sure that you can hire a contractor that will uh, do the job appropriately and have, the, and have the correct credentials by going to the Fire Safe Council website. Um, okay. Vicki, does that answer your questions? Who's my or Diane, yeah. Sorry, Diane. Yeah. Yes. Does that answer it? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Wanda. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Wanda. Wanda. Appreciate really it. Really helpful. Welcome. Really helpful. Anytime. Um, we did yes, have a question. We did have a question uh, for Chief Matthias. I don't know if he's still on the line, but I think I have the answer. They wanted uh, the person wanted to know if the the inspectors ESIs. Uh, we're still being asked to respond to complaints. The complaints go through the county and they actually go to consolid, uh, they go to OES who contracts with consolidated. And as far as I know, uh, those, those uh, complaints are still being managed by OES. So go to mynevadacounty.com, go to OES and uh, find the uh, link that takes you to uh, uh, inspect uh, inspections. Uh, and Bob, there was another question as to whether from Lauren Drutz, do you actually, Patrick might know this, do you actually have to file a complaint to get a defensible space inspector to visit or can you just no. ask for one to come by and check it out? As far so, as I know, well, there's Patrick. Yeah. If, if you're just asking for a defensible space inspection, we actually recommend that they go to uh, Fire Safe Council for a defensible space advisory visit. Because if we come out and do a defensible space inspection, um, even though you're proactive asking me to come out to your property, we still have to, if there's a violation, create a document in the county uh, computer system, which then takes it down that whole track of you're gonna get a letter stating you're in violation. So um, we definitely ask them to go get an advisory visit first. And, and I know the, the advisors are up and running. I, I've already gotten a couple of requests to go out to uh, homes and we're, we, we have a training cycle that we have to go through before we uh, go out in this new environment. And we are also, uh, we're also gonna be social distancing, wearing masks. So I know that uh, defensible space advisors in the Fire Safe Council are, uh, we're up and running again. I know I'm delinquent with the two visits I'm supposed to do. So, uh, so that's, uh, you, and again, that's accessible through uh, the Fire Safe Council's website, areyoufiresafe.com, and there is a link to a form that you can fill out, and then one of us will show up and hopefully give you some valuable advice. Okay. Um, then uh, I think, I think that's it. Uh, we've had a, boy, right on time. We got four minutes left. Does anybody have a joke? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, joke. Have a from Wanda. What, yeah. what, what kind of huh? insurance do you need uh, if Matthias tells a joke on your property. Yeah. <laughs> liability. A lot of liability insurance. 
Yeah. Or maybe medical insurance if you just, medical. you know, bust your gut laughing. I guess that could always be another one. So, okay, okay everybody. Thank you very much for enjo uh, joining us tonight. Thank you to all the speakers. And as usual, thank you, Caleb, for hosting our meeting. I really appreciate the county supporting us uh, as you do. Uh, I know it's a lot of extra work for you and you've had a busy day. I appreciate your help. Wanda, again, thank you very much for your counsel and all the work you do. And uh, Hey, Bob, if we have a couple of minutes, uh, oh. maybe Jeff could do a screen share of those photos of the Oh the yeah, I forgot. I'm sorry, Jeff. The yeah. uh, wooly drill that was on his property. I have like ten. I have like ten of them that were kind of fun. So uh, let's see here. See that? Uh, yeah. There you go. Oh, look at that. That's so cool. Oh, so let me see here. Let's start down here. This was the. Uh, like the structure defense, they came out and rolled the hoses out and all that and ran around the house. Um, this was, they went down and rescued an injured firefighter, you know, and they had uh, pulleys and ropes and the whole thing was like, you know, simulated if it was a real steep slope. There's the guys pulling the pulleys and the all that up. There they are bringing the injured firefighter up the hill. And this was the, uh, these are the training, these are the shelter deployment. Uh, these are just actually practice uh, shelters, but they, the real ones are aluminum. These are they use for practice, but they, you know, get down and, and practice getting into these things and let the fire burn over the top. Here they are doing a uh, structure defense again, dragging the hoses out. And this was a hose lay where they actually, it's about four or five guys and they, they're sort of running up the hill and they're carrying all this extra hose and they clip it and another hose and then you up, clamp it, put on another hose. So this is to put out fires where they can't get a vehicle near it. So they have to practice running out the hose to uh, get it up the hill. So that gives you an idea there. Same thing. There's a lot of guys. There's like five guys all carrying. He's got the hose on his back and carrying it uphill. There's some more of the uh, uh, shelter deployment. Wow. And there's the, uh, that's all the pulley for getting the, pulling up an injured firefighter up off a hill. There they are pulling. Wow. And there's Chief Wallen, there's Chief Wallen, uh, you know, giving the final uh, talk, but it was great. They had, um, um, you know, I mean, fire was there, off it. there was, I think Nevada City was there, Grass Valley was there, Consolidated was there, and I think there were 10 or 11 engines and probably 50 firefighters. So it was a, it was a wow. fun day. It was great. Cal Fire had eight engines and then we had two local governments. So you had 10 engines. 10 engines. I look forward to that next year. That looks like yeah. a lot of excitement. Uh, I know we're looking forward to blocking an intersection with a fight. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. Well, I'm practice tonight. Bob's ready for you. I, <laughs> that's my neighbor across the street. She's going to duke it out with somebody in an intersection. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry we're missing it this year. I, uh, I really am missing the fire drill and missing hugging my grandkids. So uh, that's my woes for the day. But uh, anyway, well, again, thank you everybody for joining us. I mean, we, again, we've had another great meeting with 40 people. I mean, this is the number that we normally have when we're live. So I really appreciate everybody's, uh, everybody's attendance. So uh, thank you all. Uh, please be safe uh, over the next month, and uh, we'll see you again in July. So thank you very much. Thank you again, Caleb.